So I'd love now to pass over to Esther, who's going to be running, facilitating our session today. Uh, Esther Foreman is the CEO of the Social Change Agency. Um, an organisation which has been supporting uh, mutual aid groups during um, the pandemic and she's also part of her local uh, mutual aid group so absolutely brilliant person to have facilitating our session today and we've got some really great speakers lined up as well so over to you Esther. Thanks Rhiannon. Um, hi everyone I hate doing online conferences I've got no feedback from anyone that's on the groups so I've no idea how the room is feeling if you guys are bored if you've got questions so everyone if your camera's off pop your camera on give us a wave let me know you're alive so um say if you don't want to put your camera on say hello in the chat um great some lovely familiar faces there it's brilliant so I hope everyone's doing really well this morning and thank you so much for giving up a Saturday afternoon um, to come and listen to us natter on about mutual aid this afternoon. So um, we've got, we're joined today by two wonderful people, Seth and Goose Green and uh, Muran from Oxford um, Mutual Aid. Um, and we're going to do some discussion, we've got some questions and answers and then we're going to open out to, to you guys um, to, to have a long discussion. I'm just going to give you a little oversight as to why we've chosen this topic and why we kind of, we chose the, the hard question about mutual aid, was it ever mutual? And um, I, we, none of us, I think here would, I'd, I certainly couldn't claim to be historically involved in a mutual aid movement. So I wouldn't be the, the font of all knowledge about mutual aid and about mutuality. Um, that's not my role, but I can come here and talk to you about the work that we have been doing with mutual aid groups that have sprung up as a kind of community response to COVID. Um, and um, for my sins, I also started to help, well, started my local one at the beginning a year ago, which seems ridiculous now, um, and actually supported uh, my group in Wilsdon Green and the Brent wide mutual aid kind of uh, network, I suppose. And then eventually um, about six months ago, we started a solidarity fund in, in Wilsdon, in, across Brent, um, where I then met the lovely Seth, um, who, who runs the Goose Green Solidarity Fund. And we've been working together um, to, to try and support other solidarity funds across you. So it, we're kind of growing as a network, we're growing on our efforts. And um, as we, from a mutual aid perspective, we've had many deep conversations um, at an organizer's level in my locality about what well, actually, are we mutual or were we just a volunteer response? Like what is actually happening? Um, and we've been, you know, there's been some heated, should we say, discussions with people that have come from the mutual mutuality movement and been like, not, we've not been mutual enough for them. And then at the same time, we've been way too dangerous um, for the traditional voluntary groups and the council. So like kind of stuck between two, two polar opposites. Where, where are we sitting? Are we a mutual movement? Are we not? Does it matter? <laughs> What's happened, where have you come from, where are we going? And actually does this debate even, um, even I guess, does it even matter? So when Rhiannon said to us, oh, do, do you fancy doing something in, in our conference? Like, yeah, this is great. Because actually we're all so busy. I'm sure many of you are like as busy as we are. We very rarely get an hour out of our day just to reflect on like the big questions. Um, and it's, it's really nice to be have this time with all of you all this, I don't know how many we've got today, I think about 30, 40 people, um, and it's a kind of group reflection and thinking time um, to really probe these questions. Um, and then we can get on with our day and carry on the chat um, with, in, in the Nudge platform afterwards. So um, my goal isn't to have you listen to me <laughs> for an hour, that would be very boring. Um, but what I want to do is um, introduce um, Seth from Goose Green and Maureen in a second. And they're going to give us um, an oversight into to their mutual aid network and um, what they've been doing. And I'm going to be posing three questions to them, which is, uh, you know, how 
how far along on the mutuality scale do you think your network is? And that's a question asked without judgment because you know we're actually in a practical sense we're just getting on with it so it's more of an intellectual curiosity about where they perceive they are and then have a uh, the second question is what well, actually what's got in the way of you of you growing or, or creating impact or more impact because I mean they're, they're both working bloody hard I don't know how <laughs> they know this so it's, it's really sort of thinking well what's got in the way there and then some thoughts for the future um if we were doing this in real life obviously we'll be in a room you guys were putting your hands up we could have way more interactive so what i'll make sure i do is keep the um keep the chat going um so if you've got a question or you've got a comment or you want to say something um i've got one eye on the chat box one eye on you guys so just make sure that you kind of want to interact um, put, put something in the chat box and I'll make sure that we can get over to you. So we're going to try and get the, the kind of the Q&A's, we'll get the discussion, the feed, sorry, of Seth and Maureen to, to talk through the questions. Then we're going to have an open up to you guys for a discussion and some reflection. So um, by that time, I'm sure it would be two o'clock. Um, and this is the space to rant. I, like it, I think it's totally fine if you've got strong opinions about this to voice them, because I think you know, we've we've kind of this is it. This is the space to do it in. So yeah, bring it on. There's a fire in a disco. Let, let's make it rage and see what happens. So um, I'm going to start with Maureen from Oxford um, Mutual Aid, who um, they've been doing amazing work. Um, we run the um, Social Change Nest, and in that we've been supporting 185 groups across the country, a majority of which have been COVID response uh, groups. And Oxford um, Mutual Aid have consistently been a high performing group um, in terms of supporting communities through trans financial transactions and fundraising. So I'm sure Marie's got a lot to talk about. Um, I mean, if you want to start just by saying a bit about who you are and, and the Mutual Aid group and how it came to be and stuff. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to see everyone. And um, yeah, definitely really important um, to take time out and to be reflexive. We don't always have that time. We've tried to integrate it more into Oxford Mutual Aid, so I really do appreciate you know moments like this. Um, so I'm Marin, I'm from Oxford Mutual Aid. I sit on the boards of directors that we have so we are lim we're limited by or not for promise profit limited by guarantee sorry and uh so we have lots of members and i'm a director um so i have a background in kind of like organizing i did a lot of stuff around um the repeal movement in ireland and um then I've done a lot of trade union activism and kind of like local organizing in, in Ireland. Um, Oxford Mutual Aid started a year ago because I guess a group of people whom I know, they got together and, um, you know, said, oh, let's start something that I wasn't in that original five, but I probably started about two days later, but I was actually in Ireland at the time. So I wasn't even in the UK. I'm here now. Um, and yeah it just kind of like it grew from from there and we just had a I guess a really dedicated group of people um lots of people with background um organizing knowledge and experience and with connections to I guess other local groups who would have been you know involved in efforts to combat kind of like food poverty inequality and things like that so we um, primarily, initially at the start, what we were doing was, you know, kind of just doing people's shopping and like that kind of, and picking up prescriptions. But obviously what we saw was, um, and funnily enough, actually, the when we started, the official council response to us said, and they were like, oh, no, you, you shouldn't set up, go to Oxford together. We'll have started in two weeks. And I'm like, well, we started now. So. <laughs> and it's funny because they've stopped. Obviously, they stopped in like September and we get all their referrals from like the city council's housing teams and homelessness teams and adult social care and things like that. 
Um, uh, so a little bit more about us. Primarily, we are providing a lot of food support to people. Um, so in terms of our numbers, we're regularly supporting 257 households. So it's 442 adults, 294 children and 43 babies. Um, and that's like a regular parcel. We ring everyone every week, um, have a chat with them, check in, do a lot of signposting, ask, you know, how, you know, does this suit you? Always have a space for like, you know, lots of our volunteers are also in receipt of food support. Um, so we try to have a very open space for that. We also then do kind of like an emergency parcel response every day. And we're probably getting, it was about five or six, but now we're getting like up to 13 or 15 a day. Um, so, and that's on top of our regular parcels. And then we also have our Kitchen Collective program, um, which is we deliver freshly cooked reheatable meals to people. And we started that initially because we had a lot of referrals from dementia, Oxfordshire and age UK. Um, so people who didn't have cooking facilities or were unable to cook and uh, definitely found that, um, definitely found that there was a real demand for it um, we've gotten a lot of resistance or like people being like oh we're not making meals for people they don't need them you know like this idea that it's it's too good for people um, but actually you know if you don't have access to cooking facilities or you can't cook for yourself especially during a lockdown or times like this when you know normal kind of the support that you would have is gone um, the meals are really important and for a lot of the elderly people that they're, they're kind of like you know they might be the, the only person you see once a week um so how we work is like obviously we have a like board of directors that you know we're responsible for the making sure that the what we're doing is in line with the the principles that we hold um at oxford mutual aid but we try to maintain a, a flat structure in that we work in teams um so every team and everybody's welcome to join whatever team they want every team will um kind of like make the decisions uh together and um you know work together to to talk about their particular issues so we have like a kitchen collective team a policy team a finance team case management team debriefing team all of that kind of stuff so before I go into, you know, I'm a, I'm aware I can talk and I don't I want to get to the questions, so I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> Hold that thought. Thank you very much. Seth, do you want to, to to talk a bit about Goose Green? Yeah, sure thing. Um, thank you, Marin. That was like an amazing overview. Um, it just goes to show how like deeply necessary a lot of these structures are. I think the sort of transition as well um, that you were talking about the kind of movement from like trade union activism and various other things like uh, for a lot of us in Goose Green that holds similar but also a lot of people this is their first time organizing and I think that is what has surprised me the most over the last year has been um, this kind of slew of mutual aid movements I think at least half I don't know I don't want to put a number on it but so many people have come and said this is the first time we've ever done anything like this it's been a real call to action a real sort of a really positive movement in that respect goose green uh, we started in may so it's nearly been a year because we were sort of discussing it in april uh, we give 50 pound installments fortnightly to anyone in our postcodes and that's se22 in south london and we give them with no judgment the only requirement is that people give us their postcode and of course uh, there are like negatives to that is that we can't really easily give money to um, rough sleepers and so we're trying to do more to collaborate with other groups uh, to kind of sort that out um, but we've kind of realized that our capacity we're four people at the moment um, yeah myself and three other people and we've given out about 10 grand so far to um, I don't actually have the numbers in that kind of impressive way that you were doing Muran um, I wish I could do that, but suffice to say, it's uh, hundreds of people in our area and, and it just keeps getting bigger. And we raise money um, in a variety of ways. Uh, as Esther was talking about, we also help sort of support other solidarity funds to grow. 
And so we've set up and kind of got this loose confederation, the London Solidarity Funds um, at londonsolidarityfunds.org.uk. And through that, we get to sort of cover a wider area because we kept, keep on getting referrals from all over the place. But it also means that we can do things like fundraising drives. And we did one of those recently and raised, I can't even remember how much, it was like 10,000 pounds potentially. Um, and it was pretty awesome. But uh, yeah, we come out of our local mutual aid group and we realized, uh, a few of us realized at the time that there was lots of like prescription shopping going on and kind of like just regular shopping, but actually, there was a certain degree of agency um, that we wanted to give to people who, who maybe didn't necessarily want to like tell us what the money was going to be used for right so you know some people have yeah people have a right to privacy people have a right to dignity uh, so for us this was a really important part of like setting up the fund so uh, we've done this in order to just kind of add another facet I mean unfortunately the local mutual aid group has since kind of dis dissipated and there are many reasons for that um, I think the reason we've stuck around so long is that we have um, as Muran was talking about um, I'm sure it's very similar like a really solid ethos and a constitution uh, we're solidarity not charity we um, you know we always aim to help people like no strings attached no judgment and we're here to grow the funds and we're here to always give more money to people and to keep keep making it more democratic um and i don't know whether should i, I should go into this now because maybe that comes up in like one of your questions esther about how mutual are we um but there's stuff to say about the democracy of it and also like the the kind of demographics of us who run the fund um and the people like in the area and how we're trying to like bridge the gap between being like a service provider or actually like engaging and being like more deep deep seated in the community, which I think is really important for like a sustainable uh, long term sort of fund and a transition to a like more horizontal and democratic society. I think that's me. I think I rambled. There we go. No, you didn't ramble, Seth. It was great. Thank you both. Um, before we get, I think what I might do is actually look, um, look at the reflection about how mutual we are um, at the end and get everyone's opinion on it. Um, but I kind of, I'm wondering, you know, from your perspectives, what's really, what do you think has got in the way of, of you guys operating in the past year and going forward? What's been the big kind of obstacles? I don't know, Seth, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, I'm going to use that incredible leftist buzzword, capacity. It's the fact that we, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we we are four people and four people who work at the same time. And so initially, I mean, what I really love about this sort of kind of liminal moment of, of kind of uh, moving towards different forms and structures for society is that it gives you space to, to dream and dream big and be utopian. Um, I mean, I come from the sort of anarchist uh, scene, so I have sort of big utopian visions but then you get stuck with kind of the realization that you're just four people dealing with I mean we cover 12,000 people in SE22 like it's a highly dense uh, a densely populated area so we don't have um, the capacity like the actual physical ability to cover all of those people like if we were to do cash drops for everyone that would be impossible um, and we want to run workshops and we want to be reaching out and we have you know all the admin to be doing so we've kind of settled on this idea that we're just going to be reaching out to people and forging links with other groups and I think for us that's really important we recognize maybe the limitations of our our group um I mean one of the big shifts was when everyone started going back to work fully when people were on furlough amazing it's like what you do with time if people have time they do amazing things we are in a time squeezed uh, society and it's deliberately you know deliberately so like most people will tell you they are always out of time and so I think that is a big, a big thing for us. Thank you. Um, Maureen? Um, yeah, definitely agree with Seth. It's like capacity is a, a huge one. I mean, we have a huge number of volunteers, um, you know, and we kind of like work online and our online platform and then we also have lots of volunteers that work at the hall and um, so and I'm you know I'm constantly thinking about you know when lockdown changes what does that mean for what we're doing um, but in terms of like 
um, I guess, things that have made it, it difficult to do what we're doing. Um, oh, just, you know, many, many things. But I think the thing that is lately, um, what I'm really tired of is like going to meetings um, with the city council or other people who would be involved in, in food support or um, kind of like engaging with food poverty. And their obsession with having a, because we're talking about the food action plan for the city addressing food poverty and their obsession with like saying, oh, but people will abuse the system, right? And I, you know, every meeting at that, and I'm like, why are we talking about this again? The other day I was at a meeting and, you know, it was all the, the big wigs and it bloody came up again. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. And I said, listen, you know, how big a problem do you think this is? Like, tell me. And then she was like, oh, it's not that big a problem. And I was like, so why are you designing, a, you know, like a system that's based on something that you don't even think is a problem, really? Um, so that's just having those. It's a waste of time, like the erection of arbitrary barriers for people to access support, this kind of like judgment that um, others you know say like oh who's deserving who's not and like you know the research says the quickest and easiest way to lift people out of food poverty is to give them money give them money and like you know I've had this discussion over and over again with people and it's just like it's like talking to a brick wall you can't and I'm just I find that exhausting really because I'm like why create a barrier when it's unnecessary because like the food we're dealing in is food surplus and do you know what I mean it's going to go to waste so that's a, a big one at the moment which I find frustrating because it's a waste of time and energy um, and then you know what has been difficult I guess like the council kind of just like stopping all support on September 11th and then like putting a huge amount of kind of pressure on us we get a lot of referrals um we've had we've had to make sure that like yeah we're built we're trying to be built on like principles and like you know have a solid foundation and like so we've have codes of conduct constitutions and like are constantly trying to like be reflexive and think about what we're doing um but like it never feels like there in, there's enough time um but we have a really great um debriefing team and a lot of people who are volunteers or like other people will use it and we kind of try to feed that back into changing some of the things we're doing um or the structures that we use um because it is important to do that. It does slow you down, which can be frustrating when you're trying to get things done quickly. But I think it's so important to do that because you, you can, and I've caught myself doing it, right? Because I say like, oh, I don't, want, I don't want a hierarchical thing. I don't want this, or I think this way. And then just to get stuff done, you're like, oh, A, B, C. And then you're like, oh, hold on a second. What am I doing? Um, so, and I think that, we because we work in teams it's a very team-based thing we don't make it's like nobody has the final hammer blow or whatever um we have votes and general meetings and like we have a lot of participant participation at general meetings um now we didn't have as much before but now it's amazing um, and a lot of people coming and we have we have discussions um about about things um and I think that keeps keeps us a bit more grounded because we're constantly having new people, fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, but trying to keep hold to the principles that we have. I mean, when we released our code of conduct um, that people kind of have to sign up to, um, I was like, we're probably going to lose a few people. But, you know, that's the nature of the game. Um, but we didn't actually lose that people. And we brought, I think, some people along with us um i've turned at least one person red that i know of so that's that's i'm going to stop talking I, I, <laughs> <Thank I'm> <laughs> yeah i mean to be honest 
um, you know, time capacity systems, they're all kind of the obstacles that I think, you know, you do face when we're trying to do work at the, the kind of coal face of, of, of communities. It is really difficult. Um, and I'm just sort of thinking here, like, I can't see everyone's faces, but if we were in, you know, in a room, I'd, I'd be curious to know how many of you guys out there are members of whatever kind of, um, I would, I've called it each lay, but whatever, you know, your community response to supporting each other through the COVID crisis. Um, just, is anyone, I can't see a show of hands, but there's a few coming up. So Sylvia, um, Biker in Newcastle, Helen in Northamptonshire, which is great. Um, do you guys um, experience the same kind of obstacles that um, Seth and Marina were talking about? Do you, I don't know if you want to say anything. Helen. Go I can. I, I mean, yeah, liaison with the council has been a bit problematic with us. We existed before COVID and we had a great relationship with the council then, but when COVID hit, they were like... Um, running around headless chickens really at the council and they didn't coordinate with us at all which is just incredibly disappointing and then of course they switched off their services and gave dumped us with loads of need that um they didn't even warn us about um and that was yeah deeply frustrating mm. thank you are, are they, are things got better subsequently not really no <laughs> It's it's thank you, Ellie. That's a really good point because I think from my experience, and I guess this is the um challenge with with doing mutual aid, is that because it's so um at the grassroots kind of at the coal face of it, it does feel like we get pulled into like we're delivering services and that old fashioned charity model um that that i guess the the concept of mutuality is fighting against as seth said it's it's mutual it's not charitable um and um ellie you've kind of mentioned that comment i don't know if you want to say anything more um about the kind of where you've you've thought the councils have wanted to turn them into charities i don't know where, where you are ellie yeah, um yeah i think it's mainly that when councils seemed to see that there was a lot of people who were willing to put a lot of work into supporting each other, they they have kind of dropped all of the, you know, the services and the need on those groups um, and put a lot of pressure on people who don't necessarily have time, like Seth was saying, like, when, or I can't remember who of you said, you know, when, when furlough officially ends and everyone goes back to work and isn't working from home, what happens to people then? And it just feels like it's viewed as this sort of silver bullet to all the cuts and austerity and like, you know, oh, the, the community can pick it up. Look, they've managed to do it through through mm. this time. But yeah, it's, it feels really um, short sighted and quite um, it feels like it's taking advantage to some extent of, of the work that people are willing to put in to support our communities when it should be the state that's putting time in and money into. Um, so yeah. That's just really interesting. Um, I don't know how people feel that that sits next to alongside the concept of mutuality, that we are people helping people and people helping each other. Um, any thoughts on that? Maureen? Um, yeah, so I have spent some time kind of like thinking about this and I'm not an expert either. Um, there is a woman, Chelsea, um, she's African-American and she's in our group um, and she is more of a, like she has a lot of knowledge on kind of like uh, the history of mutual aid and I've engaged with like Dean Spade's um, books and works and his papers and stuff. Um, and I don't have an answer, but what I keep coming back to in my head is like something being mutual, like, you know, we it, like equal participation in, in something doesn't always equal equitable outcomes when you come from a position of marginalization or when you're in poverty. So people won't have the capacity to participate in the same way. Um, and like, we're very much 
grounded in the idea that it is solidarity, not charity. We actively chose not to be a charity. We make political statements. We will continue to do so. We work heavily, um, not heavily, geez, uh, closely with kind of like ACOR and the Renters Union and other kind of like um, groups that we see that are tackling issues of inequality um, around us. And I don't have the answers, but I think it's it's so important to like keep keep coming back to it and keep you know um, taking time to to think about it as a group. Um, so like Dean Spade, like he's he wrote a paper on the well, obviously his book is great, but um, he wrote a, a paper on uh, the law center and like their kind of setup, um, and I found that really interesting to read. Um, cause we were just talking about like at the time codes of conduct and like making things less hierarchical because what happens is, it's like when you're around all the time, which I am, because I'm like, that means you get organizational knowledge and within OMA, like knowledge can equate to a kind of power because you know what's happening. Um, and other people don't so therefore they don't feel empowered to make decisions or like don't feel confident um so like we've tried to set about like you know creating more organizational knowledge by having shadowing finding where the gaps are and um, building people up and just trying to follow models like i you know we're reflexive we're not you know we're trying to be super flexible so you know we don't have the answers there will be problems we won't get it perfect but i i you know will respond to it then do you know what i mean that's that's i think that's really important to say like you're not like set in stone and being like we do this and it's this way it's like you your principles are that way your foundation is that way the fact that you want to be political and also show solidarity with people is that way but like the kind of like way in which you do it the organizing that has to be flexible and you have to be able to to do change because i mean in terms of like debates people are like oh it's not mutual because you know uh, people are, you know, you're essentially providing food parcel service for people. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's the, it, there is a necessity for it, right? And it's just, we're looking to have more equitable outcomes. People can't be empowered if they're hungry. Um, so you, ha you have to start from that. I'm going to stop talking. No, that's great. And as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's a difference as well in the structure between you know, uh, if you were a charitable organisation, there would be a board of trustees, there would be appointed, you know, um, it would just be a very different structure. And I think with mutual aid groups, you know, anyone can get involved. It's mm. porous. It's a porous network. Um, so, that yeah, that's my thoughts. So I know that Sylvia's had a hand up for ages. I don't know if you want to say something, Sylvia. I think I might have forgotten half of it now by listening. Sorry. It's all right, no. Um, what is yeah, the council? So Newcastle has been pretty hopeless, honest, or, or all the way along. And um, I'm currently doing this mutual aid or history project where we interview people all across the country. And it's, it's fascinating. I was fascinated to see there was actually supportive councils. I couldn't believe it you know, from my own experience. Um, but it's it's pretty much, you know, it's very different in different locations. But often it's just one sympathetic officer but obviously that person is then lost in the big bureaucracy and, and doesn't stand much of a chance. Um, yeah, so I want to say again, if anybody could help us with the interviews, it would be brilliant. It would be really interesting to speak to you. Just let me know. Um, and um, the mutual stuff. So in Newcastle, we always mention when we, when we uh, hand out food parcels or whatever, what we're doing. And for many people, it's, it's an eye opener and, and they, get, they do get involved. Uh, they do offer stuff and if they don't have you know they say oh do we like clothes or you know anything just they, they are interested in keen and, and giving something back and volunteers are, are getting involved and taking on coordinating positions and stuff so it's, there's been a, a study in Kingston that uh, argues that um, most 
people who actually run these groups and, and become coordinators to have a, a lot of social capital and, and so on. Um, yes, we find that, but because of the flat structure and so on, actually many people have never done anything like it before, grow into those uh, coordinating roles and take on positions and learn. And it's just a brilliant experience. You, know, you exchange knowledge and help each other out all the time. Emma's claiming that as her research. <laughs> Emma, is that your reason? <laughs> well, yeah, but I would never use Sorry. the term social Sorry. capital because I absolutely uh, hate that term. But yeah, I am doing research around uh, mutual aid groups as well. And I think just to echo what you said, Sylvia, yeah, the relationship with the council is really one of the most critical ones. You get some really awful examples of bad behaviour, like, you know, black, you know, um, bad mouthing mutual aid groups, but then like really dreadful stuff. But um, some of it is quite positive as well. Yeah, there is, I think we've definitely found a real mixture um, and a lot of it is the uh, attitude towards risk. And I think that that's happened, um, the, the kind of the approach to risk uh, we've seen across both the charity sector and the sort of local authorities and councils and where there is a very low risk appetite. Um, they've been very suspicious of, of the groups and where there's a very high tolerance and being prepared to like, experiment in spaces and do what's right and without knowing the outcome this tends to be a better um, relationship so yeah is there anywhere that we can we can see your research um Sylvia or, or Emma is it, it can be published or uh, yeah absolutely um I'll, I'll, there's another event which is happening on April the 1st which I'll, I'll put the link in the chat which might be great yeah so on that note guys just to go back to our speaker Seth Moore, um, without judgment, because this is an intellectual kind of, I guess, curiosity, how far or near to the concept of mutuality do you think your mutual aid groups are running with like 10 being super mutual, like, you know, you don't get out of bed until everyone's decided that it's happened um, to, I know that's not the correct definition of mutuality, but you understand the spirit. Um, and then one being actually not mutual at all, we're quite close to the charity model. Bearing in mind that it's, you know, these things are, are works in progress. Which one of us should feel that first? Do you want to go first, Seth? As you've, you've Shall I? Because started, I was yeah. fastest, fastest to quick draw on the mute button in the West. Um, can I be that really annoying uh, person who, who doesn't actually answer the, the question in the way that you maybe want us to answer it? Because I think I'd be quite quite yeah, frightened of numbers, <laughs> frightened of numbers in a way. Um, but I would like to pick up on maybe, I mean, I think what has been talked about before in terms of um, Miran about like empowerment, like what you were talking about, how you give people agency. And I think this is like, for us, a key part of um, what it means to be like a solidarity fund rather than like you were saying any other form of like charitable organization um, is that it's kind of recognizing that there is a structure in place which prevents people from actually being fully, I mean, I'm going to just say it in kind of like a humanistic way, being fully human, um, which is that they are deprived of resources, they're deprived like historically through like mechanisms of colonialism, through mechanisms of um, wealth and like, I mean, we're talking about, so Goose Green is the last bit of like common land in East Dulwich. Um, it was saved from the enclosures in the 1600s, uh, which is, I'm going to shout out to Dan here. He found that out for me. I wish I'd known that earlier because I'm all about the history of enclosure. Um, but it is about recognizing that there are so many barriers that stop people from being empowered and that stop people from, you know, as Sylvia was saying, like the majority of, of people who are the admins of the Goose Green Solidarity Fund are primarily middle class and primarily white. Um, and for us, we've recognized that from the very beginning as an issue. So we've tried to bring in structures like alternative structures. So for we have a kind of dem democratizing committee where we engage with the fund users, the people who, who we give the grants to, and we say, um, here we have now a pot of money, we can give you laptops and we can give you access to the internet, we can give you things that remove these barriers as a result of like your, you know, fi uh, financial situation, which, you know, we have been consistent from day one saying financial inequality is not an individual issue, it's a historical one, it's a, a structural one. So we're going to give you this money, have these laptops, take part, you know, we want 
and we, and we give them like power of veto. We give them decision making um, power because we don't want to be run by us. <laughs> really, we want to be led by the people who, you know, if we're in this community, then we can't pay lip service to it. We actually have to say, you know, like this is us. We're nailing our colors to the mast. You have the power. And I think that is really important for us. And so uh, we're not there yet because it, we're still kind of in this moment where people perceive us as a service provider a lot of the time. And I think the main work up till now has been when we're talking to people who use the fund, we uh, engage them in conversation. We have uh, a really kind of lovely um, dialogue either in person when we're doing cash jobs, drops or like via email. And people come and they, they feel guilty and they feel like ashamed. And it's like kind of horrific because you're like, well, no, this is not my money. And, you know, the people who gave it, like, you know, if you're historically richer, that's, you didn't make that money either. Like you, you got it, you inherited it. You got it from like the structure that is in place. So there should be no guilt about this. This is a structural issue that, you know, primarily affects uh, poor people, BAME people. Um, you know, this is like all stuff that we've got to contend with. So we're trying to bring in these structures that actually give the power back and, and hopefully we'll make it like a longer lasting um, kind of sustainable um, thing. Because, you know, if you need the money, you are much more aware of what kind of decisions need to be made and what is like what you want from it. Like that's so important for us. Seth, I mean, I'm just going to be a bit pushy here. Do you do you have that conversation with everyone that you give money, give a grant out to? Because it's quite an in-depth <laughs> chat, isn't it? To open people up to structural inequality. Because it can take sure. years sometimes. I'd be very impressed if you were like managing to do it with everyone. Yeah, I mean, we obviously, like there are people, like we don't, that's not a requirement. You're not required to write a thesis on the kind of, um, the history of financial inequality as a result of capitalism and um, empire for you know getting your first 50 pound installment and thereafter every month but um glad to hear it <laughs> um but many people want to have these conversations as well and mm -hmm. i think you know whenever there's a space we talk about it and we talk, we push it on social media you know like muren we, we have we are like political in our outlook and we're unashamedly mm -hmm. so this is a political problem and this is a structural problem um and that's how we treat yeah. it and but, do you... but i want to say no, sorry we, no? we don't we don't have any requirements for people getting the money we are politicized that's fine you do not have to be political to get the money from us you don't have to agree with us we will give you the money because we believe human life is kind of like the base level people deserve to live and have dignity and that's it Esther, just um, yeah. let you know that uh, Nabila has also joined us now. From okay. the UK, so um, you might want to go to her with that question, or there's an interesting question that's just come up in the chat specifically at Oxford Mutual Aid there, which I'm sure Nabila could help answer. Yeah. <laughs> should, we, should, we, should we go to the... Nabila, would you hear, were you here for the question? Yes. yes. Great. So yeah, I'll, hand yeah. Yeah, I'll hand it over to, to you guys, to um, Nabila and, and Maureen. Um, to answer that and then um andrea we i promise you won't forget your question but if we do we can always bring it up in nudge um as well afterwards um yeah so Peter, mutuality where are you on the mutuality scale yeah i mean i think like um like you know sorry hi hi everyone in contact sorry i'm a bit of a family emergency but i have made it um yeah no i know just been really um it seems like a really, really great conversation so far so yeah thank you very much for having me um and yeah Murren, please um do interrupt me as and when um when I'm, i'll hand over to you once i've done my my little bit but yeah no um i think very much um you know as as seth said i think it's it's a lot to do with um kind of balancing an understanding of the fact that like lots of the structures that are in place um, there are lots of structural reasons why um, it can be difficult to be involved in like mutual aid. For example, like lots of the work we do requires you to have a computer. So like that, as an example, like is, is a really, really difficult barrier and like something really small, like we do trainings online, things like that um, are like obviously structural difficulties that we're, we would really love. And I think it's for sure like something that is really important to us in the organisation to kind of tackle as best we can, because I think it's an important part of being a mutual aid organization is actually being like 
like upholding those principles and that requires us to go no it's important it's on us the onus is on us to make the effort and like on, on the organization to make the effort to make sure that everyone can participate in it like the mutual aid being inaccessible doesn't make any sense so um and for whatever reasons for kind of like as as you mentioned because of the all of the structures um that have made it that way over the last however many years um so yeah i mean i think that it's it's difficult i mean i definitely think that it's like a journey that that we're like on as an organization not to sound too pretentious i realized that sounded pretentious as it came out of my mouth so apologies um <laughs> i don't like to talk about the journey that anyone's on us with it. but um but yeah i definitely think it's something that we're working on and i think that being political is a huge part of like doing that effectively um and like advocating for change like more widely mm. can also like affect how you work as an organization as well um but yeah i mean like for sure we have um we've always like and try to always encourage people that are like receiving support quote unquote to like also participate and like for our like volunteers to also receive support and like it to work in a way in which it isn't like oh if you are volunteering at the hall you don't then like pick up your back box of veg for the week like you should do that and that's what mutual aid is um and so yeah i think that it's definitely something that we're working on and it, and it for sure like has its challenges mm -hmm. particularly because of like restrictions and all that kind of stuff that mean that we can't like we'll just meet up in the hall or deliver training at people's houses and stuff like that but it's for yeah. sure something that, that i think we work on and talk about um quite a lot as an organization Maren, i don't know if you have anything to add um i think that was very good nabila welcome um amazing organizer Nabila there she is does the spreadsheets that I can't do anyway and um, I think a way of like yeah I mean to to repeat what Nabila said it's a journey you know it is something that we think about all the time we're like how do we you know encourage people to to participate more but also like there has to be like an acknowledgement of those structural barriers that are in place and it's not just like laptops it's also like time or if you're living in food insecurity or financial insecurity there are other stresses on you that mightn't enable you to kind of like or want you want to participate mm. effectively um and it might it might be more stressful but we do have a lot of people who are in receipt of support who also volunteer and come to the meetings make decisions and like we work Nimbila can speak more to this but like we work with them um, which has been more recently and it's been really really great we're working with um Syrian sisters and South Asian women's voice um and so obviously um you know we make it's we make decisions with mm. them and like we are planning all the ramadan stuff together and like exciting we might have a syrian sisters cooking book for um ramadan mm. but like that's just happy thing but um yeah i think that it's hard to put a, a number on it i think it it ebbs and it flows but like because because of those structural barriers that are historical and because like you want to create equitable outcomes not just like you know equality of kind of mm. like access because some people don't want access in the same way or don't need to um mm. so. yeah I understand I think it was I think what's really interesting and Rihanna's going to shout to me in a minute because we've only got three minutes left before she has to do her announcements um I think um, I really wanted to get into like what we what we hope for the future for mutual aid and I'm, all these great questions are coming up so I'm really hoping that you guys can move over to the lunch platform afterwards. I think there's a question that is outstanding for me which is that um, you know we're both talking about mutuality and actually that it is being involved in it is politicised it is a political movement you know and actually my experience in my mutual aid is that it isn't and actually we've been very quiet about it um, and actually been getting on with the hard work of making sure people have enough to eat and you know can pay for their heating and can give back and, and not fall off the cliff um, and we haven't really had the time because going back to the commodities that work no one's got any bloody time to do anything else we're just sort of squishing it in between all the other work that we're doing um what you know can we have a future where mutual aid is not politicized or is it only ever going to end up either evolving into charity structure not politicized 
or becoming politicized if it is genuine mutual aid? And you've got two minutes to answer that. You've got a minute each, guys, a minute each. Maureen, do you want to go? A minute, and I'm going to cut you off. Go. I, I think it has to be politicized um, importantly for the future because we've learned so much uh, in the last year. Not every mutual aid group is going to want to be politicized, and that's fine. We recognize that, but it's super, super important to us because of the experience that we had. And it's, you know, people are telling us stuff every day, and, you know, you have a responsibility to, to then advocate for that change. Um, and I think that hopefully now that we're all more connected, we can connect with each other and actually see it as a, an opportunity to have a, a nationwide, you know, we have a platform, we did the response to COVID-19, you listen to us, I don't know, the future, ooh. But yeah, I, I think it has to, we have to have some sort of like political voice because it is a political project. I just can't see how you can depoliticize something when it's like based on structural inequalities. All right, stop. Thank you, Seth. Go. Uh, yeah, I, I parrot all of that. That is entirely, yeah, I agree with all of that. I'd say that my experience personally in working with political projects versus like ones that aren't as political, uh, the ones that aren't as political tend to fall apart um, in a way because there's no like cohesive kind of glue that sticks you together. And this is like my local mutual aid group, which did a lot of great work, but eventually got into really like um, distressing arguments that were completely not grounded in like a, an analysis of class or an analysis of race. It was like totally super structural uh, rather than like foundational. I think we have to be foundational when we talk about um, the work that we're doing because it stems from like the very structure of society. As Miran said, like we need to be just totally vocal about that and completely aware of the politics, even if we're not aligned and we aren't, we're like explicitly not aligned to a political party um, or and we're independent from any group uh, and long may that be so. But we need to recognize that it's like politics with a with a big capital P. It's everywhere. We're swimming yeah. through the soup of it. We have to be clear, otherwise we will get lost and we will drown. Yeah. I, I agree with both of you, just from my experience, and I think the third element I'd add on to that is that if, if you've got mutual aid groups that are not politicised and that do not hang around but are still working, they tend to move much more towards the delivering services model and the charitable kind of, kind of the old fashioned kind of charity deserving poor kind of model. So um, I can definitely see the future evolving now. Rihanna's, Rihanna's about to shout at me. So I just want to say thank you very much. I feel like we could have, we're just getting going really. And I, I'm sure that everyone here has got opinions and thoughts about all of this. Um, and I am longing for the day that we can all meet up in person and have long chats about this over pints of beer or coffee and cake or whatever. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you um, all, uh, Maureen, Avila and, and Seth, thank you for your time and for everyone else to, to show up on a Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm.